The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This podcast is brought to you by MetLife 360 Health. MetLife has partnered with Teladoc to provide 360 Health virtual care, which gives your clients access to more than 50,000 local and global medical specialists through the convenience of the 360 Health virtual care app. And best of all, it's at no extra cost as part of their MetLife Protect policy. 360 Health helps to defend against serious illnesses so you can live healthier for longer. MetLife, inspired by you. Welcome back to the XY Advisor podcast. It's Fraser Jack here and today I'm joined by Daniel Donovan. G'day, mate. G'day, Fraser. How are you? Uh, I'm going very well, mate. Going well. How about yourself? Yeah, but tremendous. Thank you for asking. Uh, now, we uh, we wanted to talk all sorts of, sort of things today about your journey through financial advice and, and where you're heading in the future. So, But to, to give us a bit of a, a round off to start with, tell us a little bit about where you are at the moment and what you're doing. Uh, I work with a, a fantastic company called Verse Wealth. Uh, I am their head of operations uh, and one of their financial advisors as part of the, the, the broader team. Fantastic. I love the fact that you've got two hats, head of operations and financial advisor. We're going to get a little bit more into that uh, as we go through, but but let's go back in time. Let's uh, talk about your career and your journey. Uh, tell us where it all started. Um, you know, you left school. What did you want to be when you grow up? That's a great question, Fraser. And I think like a lot of people, I, I didn't have a, a great idea at the time of what I wanted to be. Um, I applied uh, I, during the uni days. Uh, I worked at Apple uh, in one of their retail stores here in Melbourne. Uh, and I was there for five years in, in lots of different capacities um, across sales and technical uh, support and the like. Uh, and I guess that's where they, I really first uh, really got my first experience in a really culture-based uh, company like Apple. Um, they really value their people, uh, value their customer experience, um, value their systems and processes. And I, I love my time there. It was one of the, one of the best uh, jobs that I've had so far. Uh, after uni, jumped out of uni into a, into a grad role in a consultancy firm, again, not knowing what I really wanted to do, but thought I'd give that a try, worked in a bit of risk and compliance, still wasn't really fulfilled, um, wanted to do something more in the money space, moved again into a, a funds management role in, in operations, which I enjoyed the, the operation side of it, but again, the business didn't quite align with uh, my values, um, and then I thought, well... Uh, I looked at financial advice early on in my career. Uh, most of the roles are quite salesy and uh, very focused on targets and um, more than numbers rather than the, the people. Um, and that's where I thought, well, if I'm going to move into advice, uh, I'm going to find a company that aligns with my values and does it the way that I think it should be done. Uh, and funnily enough, Fraser, uh, XY Advisor, the podcast was one of the first resources that I that I l- uh, looked into uh, and, and utilized it in part of my journey a lot of the roles you apply for in advice require experience even at entry level like most jobs um, and I thought well how do I get my foot in the door and I thought learning about other people's experiences would be a would be a good way to start so 60 70 we'll have any podcasts there were at the time many more now obviously but binge listen through all of those and that's what kind of kick-started my uh, uh, love of advice Wow, I love the old, uh, um, you know, long time listener, first time caller scenario here. Um, I want to go back. I want. I want to go back uh, through. I will. Get, I'll get to the stuff of values because I think they're really important. I want to. I want to dive into that a bit deeper. Um, I want to go back to the the Apple Store, the culture. Obviously, um, you know, there's certain, you know, these large businesses. If we talk about the McDonald mcdonaldized type thing you know where mm. things are set up. There's lots of systems. There's lots of support networks. As you mentioned, a really cool culture. 
tell us about those learnings from that environment. And uh, I, I, I want to know a bit more about how, how you use them today, obviously. But I want, I want to know about that structure that was involved in that larger business because a lot of people come into this in a small business way and they haven't mm. had that, that experience through a really strong culture business. Mm, I, I can I can sum it up, phrase I guess, by a first date app. I remember walking down the corridor of the the shopping centre, and this this roar came through the shopping centre. And it's eight thirty in the morning before the shops open. I thought, well, that's a bit strange. Um, anyway, I turned the corner into the Apple store, and that same roar happened for me. And it's how I'm not sure if it still happens now, but Apple welcomes all employees with a, a large. It's called they call it a warm welcome. Um, and it's just everyone going absolutely crazy, excited, wooing, clapping, cheering for you as you enter the store. And I just remember being thinking like, this is my first experience of, of working here. Um, and it's such a cool, welcoming experience to already feel a part of the team, not having met anyone else there. So it's kind of from there, you know, the team was small. Um, we spent a lot of time together, uh, great leadership around, um, you know, going above and beyond for customers, really focusing on, um, you know, under promising, over delivering and, um, you know, people would come into the store and just see all these people everywhere and they'd think, how do you, how do you cope? It's just noise, it's people everywhere and we like to call it, call it the time organised chaos. Everyone knew exactly where they needed to be, everyone knew exactly what coverage areas they needed to look after, uh, what questions to ask. Um, there was no ever pressure any sales or anything like that. So it was very much um, people-driven um, and one of the key things for Apple is that their soul is their people and they really did live that uh, throughout my journey there, um, always seeking to, to give great feedback, um, always seeking it and, and giving it as well in both ways, um, not just from, from teammates but also from, from customers as well through the, through the Network Motorsport system. So um, a, lot of those, a lot of those key pillars, I guess, that um, all coming back to, I guess, people in the first instance. Apple really believed that if you look after your people, they'll look, you look, after, they'll look after the customers. Um, and that's something I think is really rings true you know, in today's day and age with a lot of businesses. And was that something that was consciously talked about, you know, the fact that you're going to get looked after here because we want you to look after our people? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the fact, you know, uh, that I could go through an entire day, sell a pair of headphones and the person next to me could sell eight iPhones and we were celebrated the same way just kind of indicates that we were talking about the product because we loved it and because we really wanted to give that great experience to customers um, to really help them uh, in their lives rather than trying to push a product on that might not be right for them. Uh, and there often be times where I say, actually, it sounds like based on what you're talking about, that an iPhone or a Mac isn't actually what's best for you uh, in this in this instance. And um, and people just value that honesty, really. I think that's um, you go into a, a shop like that and you think, well, I'm just going to be so upsold and cross-sold and I'll walk out with eight things I didn't need in the first place. Um, you know, with a top spec computer to, to do a bit of internet browsing. So, um, you know, it was that kind of customer first culture that really um, was, was celebrated daily in, in not just the interactions you had with customers, but also, you know, in the way that we were, uh, uh, where the, the, the metrics and the targets worked as well, or the lack thereof in that sense. Yeah, just listen to your story. It feels to me like you were paid to do a job at the time, but the the learnings from and working in that practice is, will continue to pay dividends to you for the rest of your life as you go through your career. Absolutely, Fraser, one hundred percent. I just think that if if a lot of people, I mean, I can't speak for the culture now. It's, it's been a while since I've worked there, but if everyone had gone and gone through that experience, worked in customer service, you know, with that kind of business behind them that that supported their learning and development into just being a better person and you know progressing and. Um, and growing and developing, I think um, I think there'd be a lot better people in, people in this, uh, you know, in advice and other industries. Yeah, it probably also gave you the opportunity to, you know, from a tech background point of view, being able to engage in in the, the ways that technology can be used in in user experience or customer experience. Spot on, spot on. I think you know, I always loved technology growing up, and um, you know, enjoyed learning the new things, but also see the technological development in the store itself from, you know, the point of sale system to the, the concierge system to the repair system to, to the ordering system, whatever it was, um, Apple heavily embraced that. Um, and it just got better and better throughout my time there to, to really enable the team members on the floor to be able to better help customers by knowing, you know, who's in the queue, where are they, where are they, you know, there was no kind of waiting area necessarily. You, know, you could just wait anywhere in the store but you would know when your next appointment would where would they be based on the system and a brief description of what they were wearing and uh, where they were located generally in the store. 
So often customers would walk up and go, Michael, and they go, oh, it, it is Michael. How did you know? Um, and we would just say, oh, I just knew it was you, um, just so we didn't reveal the secrets. But, um, but yeah, the amount, of, the amount of effort and time and um, detail that Apple would go to around that was, um, yeah, definitely life lessons for in the role that I'm in now, head of operations of a, of a growing business, um, always kind of having that one eye on how can we do things better, how can we improve, how can we be more efficient, because um, it's definitely easy to get uh, in the day-to-day of being busy and seeing clients and helping people and, um, you know, taking that time to step back and, and think how can we be doing this better is, is, is so important. Yep. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more as we go through because I think there's there's definitely a clear pathways that we can draw between what you were doing there and what you're doing now. Um, I want to just quickly touch on, you mentioned um, being aligned with your values and understanding what your values were. I guess um, it's sometimes hard to work out what your values are. Did you do some work with that or did you did you have some clear ideas of who you wanted to be? Uh, what you not, stood a, for? not officially, I guess, Fraser. I mean, I guess through throughout my experience at Apple and, and other, you know, gro- growing up and the the people that I spent time with, I guess, I kind of learnt more about what they were and what what they what what is important to me, and not just from a, a personal side of things, but from a work side of things. And often those those two things can be very interconnected um, as well. Um, and you know, if, if if you have to be someone different at work and completely change who you are, it can often be quite challenging to spend forty hours doing that and then going home a different person. So. Um, it's definitely something I have found at, at some of the roles that I've done where I've had to be a, a different Daniel at work to who I am at home and um, and that's not someone that I wanted to be. I wanted some, a, a place that embraced uh, who I was for, for all the, the person I was, you know, uh, you know, all, all, all the weirdness that, 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 that comes with being a, a person, uh, embracing all that. So, um, so yeah, that, you know, things around you know the, the honesty piece, the, the the you know the integrity, all all the, the key ones that I guess that that a lot of people do share. But I guess for me, it's re- really focusing on people first, making sure that you know they look after that. You go out of your way to help your teammates. You go out of your way to be honest and transparent and get to the truth quickly and and actually reflect a lot of the values that I hold. Reflect in a lot of the values that first hold the five key ones that we that we have every day that. Uh, are not just words on the wall, but uh, are, are very much lived uh, and shared and and um, and celebrated. Yeah, now that's a, this is a really interesting point because a lot of people don't understand or get to that bottom of what they stand for, and they get into a job and they just think, oh well, it's work, and but they have to be somebody different, as you mentioned, the different Daniel at work. Um, when you when you started working at Verse, was that something that was strong on the the conversation when you were talking about starting starting your work there or as a career? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in terms of, of how the, the values, you know, what they are, what, what's yeah. expected of them, um, you know, and I've seen them develop over, over the journey as well. But it just it very much felt, it might be sound a little cliche, but it very felt like I was, I was home, in quotation marks, I guess you would call it, when I was, I was at Verse. It, it felt like I didn't have to be anyone else. I could just, you know, the, the things that were important to them were important to me. The, like I said earlier, the, the focus on transparency, the focus on um, client, the focus on team, um, the focus on improving, um, making things really simple. Um, those were the things I just thought were, for me, no-brainers. But to, to see a company celebrate that uh, and to focus on that and to live that each day, it just, just made my integration into the team that much more easy. Yep. Now, tell us about that journey in. Where, where did it start for you and how did you, how did you have a start, get a start with Verse? Um, so I actually initially read an, an article uh, in the Money Money Management Magazine, I think it was called at the time, um, back in mid-2017 where there was an article written on Verse. Um, and uh, I remember reading that article thinking, this, this business is really impressive. Uh, and I thought, well, um, I, don't, I don't know anyone in the industry. I just thought I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, I'll reach out to a few different people. Um, so Verse is one. There were a couple of others at the time. Um, purely with the expectation of just getting to know the person, getting their experience, similar kind of, of, of what XY did for me as well, uh, but on a more personal level. And um, I reached out to the business and Corey was uh, very gracious with his time. We caught up for a coffee um, at the time, you know, and that was just a really easy conversation. Um, again, lots of synergies across what, what was important to both of us. And um, whilst there was nothing, uh, I didn't go in with an expectation of a job or anything like that. It was something that I wanted to learn from Corey and, and, and get his advice and, and mentorship. Uh, and, and over that journey, um, you know, we, we kept in touch. And, and nine months later, uh, the person that was in the role that I started at first as, as a client experience manager looking after uh, implementation 
Um, she decided to go on a holiday for, for nine months around the world. Um, and Corey offered me the gig uh, and said, the job's yours if, if, you, if, if you'd like it. And I thought, um, um, I jumped at the opportunity. I really thought, hang on, this is a, exactly the type of business I want to work in, who do advice the exact way that I, I, want it to, that I think it should be done. Um, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. So where were you working at the time before, when you when you had that when Corey reached out and said you know come along come along and be uh, I was in a, a funds management business uh, at the time uh, working in the city in an operations role um, we managed money for uh, uh, religious organisations and charities and yeah it was, it was they didn't have as as much of a focus on the customer and I didn't really see the the end result as much working in operations um, which is which is kind of what sparked my interest in in maybe doing something more for the for, for retail style customers that you know that, that would really value the advice and uh, and get a lot out of it. Yeah, I always relate this back to human beings. That if some human beings just just don't want to be you know in front of a, a customer or a client or another human being and get their reaction, and are quite happy to work in that in that op, that back office or that area where they you know administer you know like doing funds management or or picking stocks, whatever it might be. And then other people just really love that being able to see the client's face when you they achieve goals or whatever it might be and, and being part yeah. of that story, um, which is also, you know, I love seeing that too. Uh, so tell me yeah. about that start then. You started with the client experience uh, at first. Tell us about the first day and how you got it and, you know, coming into that business. Funnily, funny you say that, Fraser, because my first day at Verse was eerily similar to my first day at Apple. Um, we were working at the old World Trade Center building down uh, in the city and uh, I was in the waiting area and I heard Justin Timberlake playing. Um, and I was like, that's, that's quite strange. And they knew one of my favorite artists is Justin Timberlake. Um, and I walked into the office and all the teammates were on Zoom. Backy, Michael Back, for those of you who know him, um, Corey was there. Um, Backy was on Zoom in a cafe, I think, in Brisbane, um, just grooving and jamming um, like nobody was watching. You know, they, they'd stuck up, you know, pictures on the wall and got my desk already and all, all these kinds of small things. All, all put together just made me feel like I was part of the team already. So, yeah, that, that, that absolutely nailed the first day. Um, and, yeah, it, it's, I guess from there that's, that's cemented uh, for me the, the decision to work with Verse and, 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 uh, and, and to know that I made the right decision on that side. Um, and for me it's always been trying to then give back to, as our, our team's grown at the time. It was uh, myself, Corey, and uh, Joreen, who is one of our teammates in the Philippines, um, and now we're a team of, I think, 15 or 16 now, uh, four, four and a bit years later. So, um, yeah, that focus on people and culture and, and you know, uh, being a, a great teammate uh, is something that, that's, that's always been deeply within me to, to give back to those as, as the team grows. Yeah, amazing first day, amazing experience to be welcomed in and, you know, to instantly feel like you're part of the, part of the team. Tell, tell me a little bit about your journey throughout those last four and a half years. What, you know, as, as your roles progressed, as things have changed? Absolutely. Um, so I, I started in that implementation role. Uh, that was my first role in advice. So I took a lot of time at the start, really learning how the advice process works about the industry, about uh, the way Verse do it. Um, spent a lot of time in, in meetings with Corey, um, learning from him and learning the way that he uh, delivers advice. He's a, he's a wonderful uh, advisor um, and all of his clients uh, would say so. Um, and just a great, a great mentor and teacher as well, uh, and a great, just a great person all around, really. Um, but so I spent a lot of time with him in, in those meetings um, to develop my advisor skills. Uh, being an advisor was always a, a goal of mine uh, to see my own clients. I did really enjoy the back of house and the operations and, and doing that side of things, but being able to see the impact of the advice was also really appealing to me as well. So. Uh, it was about a year later that I, I, I actually ended up seeing my first client. Uh, was on, uh, I remember them specifically, a Navy guy. Uh, you, you know, they say you never forget your first client. Um, absolutely lovely. Um, did a bit of advice on his military super room, um, setting him up with a, a personal investment account. Um, and yeah, it was it was it was a shock to, to be honest, being a year into advice and being able to see my first client. But um, Corey had amazing trust and faith in me. Uh, again, really shows that the the values of the business and you know never settling and always trying to improve and be better and 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 you know the the most of your growth occurs out outside of your comfort zone as well. So um, and that just that was a wonderful experience. And, and since then, my time's been split, I guess, between uh, seeing clients and and working on uh, uh, the operation of the business as the head of ops. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that, that I've got a couple of hats. I guess the operations hat has about eight hundred and forty three other hats. 
um, within it, as as does uh, a couple of other roles we have at Verse. So, you know, whether it's IT or systems or processes or um, compliance or uh, payroll, you name it, I probably do some of it. Um, but uh, funnily enough, you know, working at Apple has its has its perks, absolutely. But as soon as someone finds out you used to work at Apple, you become the default IT guy, <laughs> and uh, all their iPhone and iPad issues all come out of the woodwork. And um, which <laughs> you've got to be careful who you tell Fraser if you worked at Apple. I want to know. Well, we've told everyone now. I want to know if you've got a genius <laughs> bar set up in the office. <laughs> I should. I should. Shouldn't I? <laughs> Get people to make appointments. Um, all right, fantastic. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That split, that uh, that that working with your split hats. Tell me about that role. Is that um, you've sort of evolved into that role? Um, you yeah. know, again, people, you know, when you get to work somewhere for a long period, people think, oh, you've got strengths in that area. You've got great organisational strengths. You've got great, you know, tech and IT strengths, and and that customer service mm. overlay of you know making sure the clients are getting a great experience. Um, how mm. does that hat? work with your advisor hat is it 50 50 or what like what what, what sort of a time frame is it uh, well, it, it, that's an interesting question Fraser I guess it's it's depending on the needs of the business I guess and, and more and more the the operation of the business is taking more and more of my time at this at this point um, you know I, I got into the operations role based on the business not being as kind of well operationalized as I thought it maybe needed to be at the time um, it had a great uh, client experience it just could have been done a lot better um, more efficiently with better systems and better technology. Um, uh, we always try and, uh, you know, we want to have a technology-driven uh, system, uh, but advisor-led. Um, you know, it's, te- it's really technology-enabled. That's that's a better way to put it, I'd say. Technology-enabled, advisor-driven. Um, and, you know, given given the expansion of technology over the last, you know, even five years, you know, even 10 years, to, even last year, depending on, on what area you're talking about, but... Really, you know, focusing on that client experience and um, making sure the business is well operationalized to grow. So it, it's just something that kind of came naturally to me, or is naturally of interest to me. Um, something that naturally um, that I enjoy doing. Uh, and Corey saw that as well, and um, he's uh, more of a, a higher level person, whereas I'm more of a, of a detailed person uh, in that side of things. So we worked well together in that sense to really well oper- operationalize the business at that time. Um, yep. So over, over the journey, it's it's kind of ebbed and flowed, but I'd say at this point, it's it's definitely more ops uh, than than advising at this point, just given given how 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 quickly the team's growing and and all the different new new and exciting things that we're we're coming across. How how important is it is for someone like Corey that to give you the space and the budget to go and put these systems in place? Because often there's you know there's time and budget are two considerations to in, in introducing new technology or new systems. Every time mm-hmm. there's change, it's like, you know, you mentioned before, you know, always improving um, as p- part of one of the mantras within the business. But that often mm-hmm. means that there's, you know, we've just got something settled in, it's working, and now we're going to, ch- you know, we're going to blow it up and change it again. How important is yeah, that, exactly. from, you know, the, from, from a management point of view for what Corey does to be able to say, you've got some space and some budget to go and put this in place or to, to make changes? He, he has the utmost faith in all teammates um, within Verse, um, and that's one of his true uh, strengths, I guess. Um, I guess I, if the way that he thinks about it is if you hire great people, you let them do their thing, they'll, they'll get the job done, I guess. So um, that's always been our mantra, um, and that's something that really, as a teammate, you really want to do your best for people like that and give back and even go above and beyond most of the time to – to kind of repay that trust, um, even when you, you instinctively think, hang on, I've only been here six months, should you really be giving me this much power and leeway and rope to, to make all these changes? So absolutely, I think that's a fundamental part of, of, of a business that, that, that wants to change and wants to be better and wants to grow um, is that, that type of leadership that, is, that does embrace change, that does, you know, doesn't tie themselves to any piece of software or system or, you know, and it's also about making sure you, you give yourself space to do that, it's easy to just be so busy that you know if it's working, oh, we'll just we'll just we'll just get to it at some point. Um, you know, versus we we ritualize the 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 improving on you know working on the business, not just in the business. You know, it's it's a full day a month most times for at least Corey and I on on how we can improve things um, and focus on what the initiatives we need to to be focusing on um, through a, through the objectives and key results, uh, system OKRs that I'm sure Corey's mentioned on, on this podcast before. So 
yeah, enables us to stay focused and and keep making those improvements and keep keep finding ways to do things better. Even though like we think we still have a fantastic client experience, we just think we can always be doing it better. Uh, and you know, it's important not to to rest on your laurels in 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 this ever changing, ever growing uh, business. Yeah, and and, uh, and and to my point as well, the thing I noticed about you guys is you are prepared to take that time once a month to do that. You are also prepared to put some money behind those changes because obviously anytime you do something like that, uh, bring on new software, there's there's changes, but there's also, you know, costs. And I, I, mean, I, I sort of feel, I don't know the, the numbers, but I feel like you're one of these businesses that are prepared to invest over and above some of what some of the others do to to into that technology. Absolutely. And, 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 and the, the money side of things is important, but also just the, the team impact as well. Getting, you know, we now have 15, 16 teammates and getting them across all the change management. Hey, we used to do it this way and now we do it this way. And these are the reasons why. And, you know, this is how it's going to impact you and you, what you do on a day to day basis. And this is the new system you need to log into and you've got to stop doing that. You know, we, we make so many changes to the client experience for the better over the course of a 12 months. I'd say more than most do in, you know, in years. And, that's just because we're we're all, we're not tied to anything, and we have a fantastic team that embrace those changes, and and all one you know, whilst their main role might be an advisor or it might be a power plan or, or whatever that might be, um, they still have a really uh, a never settle is the value that we have a never settle mindset around around getting better um, as a business, and um, you know those changes are uh, we seek feedback and uh, and input from team um, you know where it's needed and necessary and. Uh, where it's going to be valuable to make sure that, you know, it's not just our opinion, my opinion, or, or, or Corey's opinion. Um, it really is a team effort to, to make sure they're all really uh, on the same page and, and embracing the changes as, you know, as they see clients moving forward. Yeah, a lot of advisors might be worried about changes because it, it requires retraining clients as well. Like, you know, you've got a mm. great client experience and then you go and change it and say the clients, do, you know, do you, does it ever sort of, is that something that you can, obviously you would consider it, but is that, you, do you talk to your clients about the changes and, and what they're doing and, uh, and how it's improving and, and do you use that client feedback to, to make those tweaks? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, that it, we're, we're constantly seeking client feedback, you know, with each, um, what we call journey sessions or review sessions that we have with clients, whether it be annually, biannually, triannually. Um, we're always asking as part of our pre-meeting uh, survey how we could be doing things better or asking the, the net promoter score question, you know, how, you know, so they know, so we know how they're feeling about our service. Um, really make sure that's more proactive than reactive. And absolutely, you know, we have different levels of technical expertise, technical expertise in our client base. Um, some are fantastic, some are, some are not, as, as with most practices. So, you know, when you're thinking about, oh, we might launch, you know, for example, a, a client portal. You know, that's how's that going to impact the, you know, the the 30 or 40 year old versus the 50, 60, 70 year old client. Um, and really thinking about, well, it's got to make sure that, you know, it's an enhancement to the entire client experience, not just how we do it uh, and how it's going to make our lives easier, quicker and more efficient, but how it's actually going to benefit the, the, the client and, uh, and make it easier for them to do business with us. You know, for an example, we always try and use phones as much as possible where, you know, try to, try to get on the client's phone, not into their email or not onto their computer. We get so many emails, so many, you know, so much clutter we really want to meet clients where they are and where clients are is on their phone. Um, so if we can text clients a document or get them to sign it there or, you know, a quick text message to say, hey, are you still good for this meeting? Rather than an email, it just, just it's one of the many examples where we think, well, we that's a conscious decision that we made to, to shift towards that. Um, and the feedback from clients has been, been very well received to say thank you for getting out of my cluttered inbox. Um, you know, it's just easy to, 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 to get in touch with you guys knowing that that's an option. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic option. I love it. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the the, the MPS Net Promoter Score um, around, yeah. the, around the work that you do just on that feedback from clients, but then you turn it into, um, you know, reviews, good reviews, uh, NPS Net, Net Promoter Score referrals off the back of that. T- tell us a little bit how that part of the business and how that all works. That's a very good question, Fraser. I guess, and again, it's something that, um, that we spent a lot of time and effort and uh, – and, um, thought into to systematizing and, and making a process out of all of those things. So as you said, the, the net promoter score, we measure that at every before every review session. That's um, a, a client must do the type form survey in order to get to the booking system. Uh, and those two are linked. So there's just one link. The client fills out the survey. It automatically redirects them to Calendly. They book in their session. So in the past, we had clients do, we had two links and clients would do one or the other. 
So finding ways to encourage, or in this case, force clients to get that feedback to, to answer that question means that we know where, where we stand with them. Um, that then links into the, the, the Google review side of things as well. That was a big focus for us um, to really enhance our, our presence on Google. Um, I think we're up to 134 five-star reviews now. Um, and, you know, we're very much uh, proud of the, all those reviews and the, the lovely words that clients say, not just about the advisor, but also, you know, the teammate that's implementing their advice or the power planner or whoever it might be. It's, it is a real team uh, experience. Um, but that's all built into agendas and, you know, we have email templates to get people to take them directly to the Google review landing page where they, all they have to start doing is type the email, I'm sorry, type the review straight into it. Again, if you just say, hey, can you leave us a Google review? Client's got to search us, then find where's the Google review button and oh, what's my login details. And if you just think of all the different steps the client has to get to, they'll just put it into the too hard basket. But if you just make it so it's it's almost too easy or, you know, re- remove all obstacles for the clients to, to do something for you, um, it just means that there's, there's really leaving them no reason not to do it. Um, so, you know, we get a, a, a fantastic net promoter score. That then leads into the Google review. And off the back of that, we have a fantastic client referral system as well where, again, technology enabled where we introduce uh, or clients can introduce friends or family through a landing page that uh, to an email that comes from Verse that, uh, um, that then they learn more about us and if they feel like they'd like to book in, they can. Um, rather than, hey, uh, here's my number of a friend, can you reach out to them and you call them and they say, who are you and I didn't know you were calling. And So there's all these different <laughs> different parts to it, uh, Fraser, that, that you know a lot of time and effort goes into. And this is where that OKR system comes back to, the objectives and key results. One of our key results for one of our objectives, our objective is provide a world-class CX. The key result is increase our... NPS uh, from X to X, and then the actions fall off the back of that um, to to actually you know uh, to drive the, the the increase in those numbers. So it keeps us targeted. It keeps us focused on what's actually driving the the, the change there uh, to make sure that you know, that we stay on track and focus on uh, the right things. Because a lot of businesses get into the trap of trying to start or trying to finish a hundred things and finishing one and half starting eight, where we'll start six and finish five. Because um, we're just hyper focused on on what's important to us, uh, rather than starting lots of different things where we might get a ten percent increase in efficiency or or client experience. Yep, yep, wonderful. I love the world class client experience. By the way, um, oh. now I'm I'm imagining imagining all those. Uh, I, I love the review idea too, rather than a testimonial. I think I think reviews are a better one. They're a better word because testimonial just means it's going to be nice. Whereas a view review, mm. there's this chance you could be getting a one star. You know, like obviously you've done the That's net right. So you're pretty confident they're going to be uh, giving you good reviews, but the review um, from a from a consumer purchasing point of view, if I'll, I'll look at reviews because they'll it's not just testimonials. At no point in me looking at testimonials; they're all going to be good. <laughs> but, I, but reviews are great because you get uh, you, uh, you know I mean, somebody might not have had a great experience and they'll say it. Now, obviously, all of that uh, that great system, that review, that referral, that offering, you know, introduction to friends, etc., um, mm. has led to a huge amount of growth in the business. And obviously, mm. you mentioned that when you came on, there was a couple of people there, and and now you're up mm. to fifteen. Tell us about that growth uh, in the, the the people coming on, um, and how that uh, and how that referral system or that new clients coming in and getting good reviews on Google has led to such a such a uh, you know high uplift in the business business where you need to grow up to fifteen staff. Mm. So yeah, this, yeah, it's just been over four years now since I've been in the business. So um, it's it's something that we've spent a lot of time, as you, as as you mentioned, around the reviews piece. We spend uh, a lot of time on our, our marketing as well to make sure we um, we get the right um, strategy there around getting our names out there and making sure we're available to be searched for and appear high in Google rankings. And there's various different strategies that we implement um, that has led to us be able to, to more comfortably rely on our uh, leads each month and how many we get and where they're coming from. Again, we have great systems and processes in place to track where they come from, where our best ROI is, where it's not, where do we need to focus on because I think we have 11 or 12 different Calendly links where people can book in and which are all different sources uh, and then we can track where those uh, those leads come from um, so to know where to, to, to focus on. Um, and yes, that obviously leads to, to, to needing more people. And, um, you know, whilst Corey was seeing a lot of the clients when I started, or all of them, um, he needed to focus more being on the business rather than in the business. So bringing on uh, a couple more advisors um, 
uh, you know, uh, by the time COVID hit, we went back to three. I think we had a, a couple more at the time and then went back to back to a team of three. Um, uh, and it's kind of since the end of, I say the end of COVID or end of the, that first lockdown um, in the second half of 2020, where um, I think for, for, for some people, the, the pandemic is, has heightened their awareness around their money and, and made, the, made them want to seek out uh, uh, advice to, to maybe get a better understanding of where they, where they sit, you know, are they on track? Um, so from that side of things, you know, we focus a lot on, on finding great people um, and uh, that's a lot harder than I think we thought it was going to be, um, finding great people that are really aligned, uh, that are high performers that can um, kind of step into day one and hit the ground running. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's been wonderful to see over the time. You know, we, we, we used to just have um, advisors and uh, we had some teammates in the Philippines that are heavily integrated into the team who, who had a lot of their implementation and power planning work. Uh, and you know, to now having you know a couple of associates, we've now got uh, three main advisors uh, in the business. Uh, plus, Corey and myself are also um, part-time, I guess, advisors. Plus, a couple of associates. Plus, um, uh, plus eight. We have now eight in the Philippines. So, um, it's 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 been wonderful to see the team grow. Um, especially, for example, Fritzy, our our uh, she's our client experience manager now. The role that I was doing when I started, she joined the team. Uh, nearly three years ago, um, having never uh, done advice before whatsoever, um, didn't really even know what superannuation was. So she started, um, and from there, she's now you know learned all the implementation, um, the technical side of advice, to the point now where she's leading a team of three other implementation teammates uh, and mentoring and training them on how to how to implement advice. So it's that kind of thing that really that fills my cup and fulfills me um you know whilst I, I don't see as many clients i guess from a team side of things that's that's where i can still get the same sort of um fulfillment i guess from the, from those people uh people developing and growing and um you know being a small part of of, of their journey over the, over the time yeah now tell me about these teammates because you it, you know when you walked into the office the first day um you you were, you were here in the in the local melbourne melbourne office and um, it was very much around and then getting some teammates in the Philippines and, and tell us about that, um, having teammates, I guess, around the world and around different parts of Australia and how that sort of, you know, works mm. for you guys and how it's developed. And um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of businesses now that do it, but um, you know, I guess back in when you started doing it, there was a lot of people that before COVID, everybody was uh, wanting to be in the same same location. Absolutely. I think for us, it, it's always been normal. So it, it, we didn't really have to ad- adapt to it. I mean, we, yeah, we've, we, Joreen was our, our first uh, teammate in the Philippines. She was there on my first day. So, um, and, and, you know, we would catch up with her daily at that time. Um, and as I mentioned, she was heavily integrated with the team as, as much as anyone. Um, and I think for us um, that, that, that being able to do things on Zoom and, you know, still have those cultural experiences over, um, over different locations um, you know, whether it's, you know, a virtual um, a mystery murder Zoom session or, or you know, whether it's a, 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 a catch-up on a Friday, uh, you know, on Zoom for a drink or two, whatever that might be, in a way also benefited us to a degree in, in when COVID hit, when the first lockdown happened in Melbourne. For us, it was very much business as usual. Most of our meetings were already on Zoom with clients. Clients preferred to meet that way. We always gave them the option of coming into the office or not, um, but... Uh, most of them chose to do it on Zoom. It was more convenient for them. Um, and that meant that during COVID, it just meant a few of our clients that would always come into the office, we would just need to teach someone how to use Zoom and, and that process. So from a teammate point of view, um, we still have the culture rituals um, that we do with people that meet in the office. It's just virtual. We definitely value the face-to-face, don't get me wrong. And um, as an example, we just had our first uh, Philippines teammate retreat uh, a couple of weeks ago where um, the eight of them all met up in Cebu. Um, there's a, they're across three different locations in the Philippines, but um, you know some of these people have been working multiple years together, but never seen each other face to face. And they all met in person for a, a two and a half day retreat, and that was uh, super valuable for those team members um, to be able to to have that face to face interaction because it's definitely part of over the COVID experience. We've noticed that you lose some of that to a degree. You can't keep all the, the cultural side of things virtual all the time. Um, where, 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 you, where you can. So um, 
yeah, don't get me wrong, wrong. We recognize the value of the face-to-face side of things. We still make an effort as a team to go into the office a couple of days a week all together on the same days to, 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 to have those, those kind of water cooler moments, as you might call them, or, or things like that that you just don't get at home. And, you know, that's, that was evidence is that the Philippines retreat a couple of weeks ago. But, um, but you know, now we've got um, we have an advisor in, in Brisbane, Ellie. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really wanting to be a national business um, with, you know, uh, teammates overseas as well helping us. Um, and, you know, doing that virtually is, um, has many more benefits than it would on the, on the con side of things. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. And you mentioned that um, uh, three advisors, uh, three full-time advisors, two working on in the business with yourself and Corey, mm-hmm. and, and associates as well. Did you say associate advisors coming through as a professional year student? Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got Josh and Stu. Um, Josh is um, just finished his professional year, actually, just doing the the final checks now before we officially uh, appoint him. And Stu um, is, uh, I believe, next year is going to start his professional year uh, or the year after. So. Um, you know, they're, they're wonderful resources uh, uh, for the advisors in the team. And they're also just fantastic teammates. We didn't even have associates and, um, and that was uh, one of the other rituals we have in place called capacity planning where we, we look at the team's capacity and, uh, and, you know, where is it stretched? Where are we spending our time? Where can we be better spending our time? And Stu was our, uh, our first associate that we brought on uh, January last year. Um, and uh, it was off the back of that capacity planning where, Ash, one of our other advisors, was spending about 20 hours a week taking the introductory chats and doing his own strategy work. And we thought, well, if we could get someone who would just take those introductory chats to the business and do all of the strategy work for the advisors, and that would free up Ash's time, it, it, when we talked about it, we thought, actually, that's a, that's a no-brainer. So th- th- having those kind of good rituals and systems in place, like capacity planning, has led to, to, to Stu being here at Verse. And off the back of that, now there's we have Josh and... There'll be more associates before before too long, but yeah, being able to to bring associates into the business and really grow and nurture them as advisors and have them be able to sit in meetings where available and learn from more senior advisors to really uh, develop them as as advisors, I think is 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 very rewarding and um, a, a great thing for both the advisor uh, and and the associate. Yep, tell me a bit more about that capacity train or the capacity. Tra- or, um, planning process that you go through planning mm-hmm. that you go through but also um you know how that looks for you over the over the short term is it you know plenty more growth on its way uh yes uh, we hope so i mean i say we hope so there's definitely a plan in place around that um so yeah it, it, it's it is an hour session we spend all together um we all fill out uh, an online excel spreadsheet that, that goes to the different areas of time that you could spend whether it's with new clients, existing clients, um, implementation, power planning, we, we break it down quite su- substantially to, to be able to really narrow down to where that time is going. Um, and it also just gives a good chance for teammates to check in with each other. It's not often, you know, you know how are you going busy? Most people say busy, but how busy is busy? Are, are you drowning in work? Uh, are you actually, you know, more of a seven out of 10? You can kind of pick up some slack. And to be able to know, you know, which advisors are overwhelmed, you know, which associates are overwhelmed, you know, what part of the business do we need to kind of give more slack to or give more assistance to perhaps, um, it just is really beneficial to know as, as team to know who do we need to look out for or, 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 or the like. So as with most businesses, we go through really busy times and then not so busy times. So it's really in those busy times where we can really focus and go, well, okay, things are really getting um, busy at the moment. We don't want to let the, the water boil over the outside of the pot. So what are the things we need to focus on? Where do we need to take from? What do we just need to do um, to make sure that we don't blow up the team? Because we'll always focus on team first um, rather than growth. We don't want to grow at the expense of, of team. That's That would be counterintuitive. So, um, But, yes, absolutely, growth is, is, is on the agenda. Um, we want to be, you know, across other cities in, in Australia. We want to have more advisors in Melbourne and be able to support the team around them with, with more associates and more um, teammates in the Philippines helping us from a power planning and, and implementation perspective. So, um, yeah, the FY22-23 is going to be a, a big year for us, um, for having brought on um, Anna and Ellie in the first half of, of this year, the so last half of 21-22. Um, the plan is to be to bring more of those, uh, more, more wonderful advisors to the team, but, um, you know, how long that takes, hopefully not too, not too long uh, down the track, but um, we, we really want to make sure we get the right people uh, first, that you know, they can be really high performers, and, and as I mentioned earlier, hit the ground running on our on our day one. 
Yeah, fantastic. And with that uh, always improvement attitude, what are the things that you're working on within the business now for sort of the short term future? Yeah, so for, for, the, for the next 12 months, Fraser, it's, for us it's really about simplifying our process. We feel like our clients do so many different things from when they reach out to when they finish their implementation. Um, we just think that could be so much better. Uh, people spend way too long with us, we think. Um, you know, it could be anywhere from 90 days to 180 days, depending on how complex, I guess, your implementation is. And I think for any professional service, I think that's just too, that's just way too long. Um, so a, a really big focus for us over the next 12 months is is really simplifying that process. And don't get me wrong, I, I, I think I talk about it a bit in the sense that I'm a bit hard on, on ourselves and how we do it. I think, you know, we have a fantastic uh current way of doing things and, and client experience and, and clients love it i just think we that never settle mindset just has me thinking well but it could be at least 50 percent better and if it could be 50 percent better then then you know the sky's the limit from you know where we could take it from there so um really just focusing on uh better opera oper, operationalizing i had that word earlier operationalizing um the client experience uh to improve it even more um, and really not having anything, not being tied down to anything. You know, you know, at this point, I think we've been improving things where we can around the edges, but it might be things we might need to make more wholesale changes to areas of the business um, in terms of the way we do things uh, in order to really to achieve those efficiencies. But with the same view of always having, you know, how does it impact the client, how does it impact on the value we deliver to clients and making sure that is, is always improving. But at the same time, it's just how do we better deliver that uh, at more scale with less um, manual intervention, more automation, more, you know, systems and processes that are that are valuable. I think a lot of businesses get caught up in the new shiny piece of technology and go, oh, that looks great. I'll do that. And then it just adds 30 minutes to their, you know, every client, but it only adds 2% of, you know, uh, of an overall uh, value. So, um, that's that. They're the, I guess, two of the main pillars for us: growing the team uh, and really, really simplifying uh, the way that we do things to, to to make it easier for clients to to interact with us. I think there'll be a lot of people reaching out to you afterwards to find out exactly how you're doing that because I think they might be on the agenda of quite a few quite a few people uh, over the next sort of six to 12 months. Uh, let's push it out long term. What does the business look like? Uh, what, do you have any long term strategy plans to to be you know something in the in the future? Uh, it's a good question, Fraser. I think for us, um, you know, where if you'd said we're said we're if you said we were here where we are now five years ago, I mean, I think we'd be pleasantly surprised. I think maybe we would maybe would have thought we'd be a, maybe a bit further ahead than we thought we were, just given um, how how we think how wonderful our client experience is. So I think things have taken a little longer perhaps than we thought. Um, but at the same time, um, I think we're at the point now where we have a really fantastic client experience and being able to put the right people into that um, means that we can kind of scale very easily um, with the marketing strategy that we have in place. Um, so th- those two key pillars, it's just about finding the right people. Um, so that'll be the, the focus for us moving forward. So yeah, longer term, could, could we see Verse across all capital cities? Absolutely. Um, you know, Beyond that, at this point, I don't think there's... Um, much more definitive plans in place but um, I think we're just focusing on you know getting these next you know 12 24 36 months right um, getting those those people on board and, and and growing from there fantastic Daniel thank you so much for coming on and sharing your journey through to date of course there's a TBA as this goes through <laughs> uh, if someone wants to con- continue this conversation with you what's the best way for them to reach out and find you uh, the best way would probably be um, either my email, um, daniel at versewealth.com.au. Um, I am on LinkedIn as well. Feel free to reach out to me there. Uh, and yeah, happy to have a chat to anyone who's uh, keen to learn more. Thank you so much for sharing your journey. It's been really, you've been really generous and we really appreciate it. Thank you, Fraser. Appreciate your time. 